Well, yeah. thanks for joining us, Fadzai. It's really great to catch up with you. We're sorry it didn't work out the other day, but um, we're glad we we're able to incorporate your voice into the program. Thank you. So I'll get started. Um, so as we have seen, um, women have really been hit hardest by the coronavirus pandemic. I think the outbreak has really exacerbated gaping inequalities for women around the globe, almost in every mm. sphere from health and the economy uh, to security and social protection. And yes. you know, many could make the case that women were facing an epidemic of their own uh, well before the coronavirus. And that has been evident by the unprecedented levels of political violence perpetrated against Absolutely. women. Um, mm -hmm. Zimbabwe, as you know full well, has been a prime example of this, uh, where three of your colleagues are currently out on bail, uh, as I understand correctly, after being charged with violating curfew, after they yes. were abducted, tortured, and allegedly sexually assaulted by suspected state agents, which is unfortunately yes. a trend in Zimbabwe. Um, yes. that, th that authorities have turned the tables on them and are now prosecuting them uh, with crimes demonstrates to me uh, an entirely new level of gaslighting women's experiences, claiming that your colleagues yes. had somehow imagined or made up this entire ordeal. So first, I'd like for you to please uh, give us an update on your colleagues. How are they? And, and what are the next steps in these absurd legal proceedings against them? So I think there's no running away from the fact that um, the torture that they endured is something that they're going to have to live with for a very long time. They were physically assaulted. Um, they were thrown into a pit. They were made to drink each other's urine. They were made to enchant all sorts of slogans. This torture went on for an excess of 24 hours. And the, they were made to endure this ordeal um, throughout a whole night. And just going back to how it all started is they were involved in a protest against hunger. And this protest against hunger took place obviously during the, the hard lockdown, which is what led to their initial quote unquote arrest. And um, what's interesting is that Zimbabwe is facing a starvation crisis. 7.7 .7 million uh, Zimbabweans are facing a man-made hunger crisis. And the UN report on this is a matter of public record. So it's after this protest that they were taken by state agents, abducted, um, tortured, and sexually assaulted. And the medical evidence is available um, around this. And it's after their ordeal that they were then subsequently found after a lot of noise was made and a huge national campaign was conducted, led obviously by the MDC Alliance, but a lot of civic society, churches and, you know, citizens in Zimbabwe were involved in calling for their relief because a pattern has emerged in Zimbabwe of, um, you know, these sort of and forced disappearances. We know the case of Itai Zamana, we know the case of Justina Mkoko, we know there's so many stories. The Amnesty Report is out there, the Human Rights Watch Report is out there. These stories are commonplace. And we believe it's an insult to all the victims of enforced disappearances for the state to turn the tables on these women and suggest that they faked their own abductions. I mean, you know, you can fake a story, but what you can't fake is the demeanor and the video evidence of the state in which these women were in the day they were found. I mean, you cannot fake that. Mm -hmm. You cannot fake, you know, injuries to your head. You cannot fake, and I mean, I'm sorry to say, but you know, it's a matter of public record that one of the girls has a cracked anus. You don't fake that sort of thing. You know, during the, the you know, the, the criminal proceedings relating to their, their very egregious, um, you know, proceedings, the, the bail uh, hearing, you saw that um, Netsai was in crutches. Mm -hmm. Her leg was, you know, bruised internally. How do you fake that? You can't fake that. You know, so it's, it's an insult, really. You know, it's a slap in the face to the ordeal that they endured you know, to suggest that they, they, they faked it. It really is an insult to, to what they went through. And especially just speaking as a woman, you know, when you've enjoyed a sexual assault, when you've enjoyed, you know, a torture 
of a sexual nature, sexual violence, and you make a report to the police, to be told you're lying before the perpetrators are brought to book, before an independent investigation is carried out, when you expect you know, the police to protect you in terms of their constitutional mandate, which is to protect lives and security of persons, when they turn the tables on you and tell you that you're lying before they've investigated, I mean, that is really the, the, the worst. It, it's a re-victimization of right. the women. And so, you know, I, I really wish to emphasize that, you know, that, that makes the ordeal 10 times worse than the actual uh, torture, abduction, and sexual violence that took place in the first place. And obviously, you know, it happened in the midst of this uh, pandemic. And so Zimbabwe faces two pandemics. You've got the pandemic of the coronavirus, and then you've got, you know, the authoritarian pandemic. And we're facing all these at the same time. And as you say, you know, when you're a woman, it's 10 times worse because we've got an informal economy in Zimbabwe, 90% of the economy is informal, and so women have had to bear the brunt of that. This hunger crisis, women who have to carry, you know, the the the, the brunt or the responsibility of feeding their their families. And so, you know, we we look at this, and we 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 really are um, just speaking as a citizen before anything else. Just let's remove the politics from it, because, mm -hmm. you know, without just looking at this with a human face before we look at it. With, uh, from a political prism, we have to look at the human rights violations that are taking place and call them exactly what they are. This is an affront to human dignity that should not be allowed to take place. And we continue to call for an independent investigation into what happened to those three women. Right, absolutely. And, and just so the international audience is aware, um, I know there's a lot of interest in this case. So what are the next key dates that we should be looking for in terms of the legal proceedings? So, thank you. Um, today was one of their routine remand dates. And mm. um, they, they have been told that they have to come back to court. I believe it's in the next two weeks or so. And we will keep, continue to publish those dates. Uh, what we don't have is a date when the perpetrators will be brought to book. And, you know, that is the most important date that we keep clamoring for. When are the people who perpetrated those egregious acts against those women going to be investigated? Because what we won't allow is for these acts to continuously be swept under the carpet. That is not okay. We're not going to forget what happened to them because it's one thing to keep following the proceedings that are being brought against them, but what about, uh, brought against them for this alleged fake abduction, but what about what happened to them? And, you know, it's, it's, you know, huge deception by the state, and it really is justice turned on its head against these yeah. women. We're not going to stop campaigning, and never mind the politics, it's just, you know, a, a huge violation on the rights of women, the dignity of women, the dignity of you know, human beings, what's, what's transpired against these, uh, against Nitsai, Joanna, and Cecilia. That should never happen to a human being anywhere on earth. And, you know, we will keep clamoring and asking for an independent investigation. And we thank the international community. The UN has spoken very unequivocally about what took place and is, you know, joining us in the call for an independent investigation because the state is extremely compromised here. So... Yes. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, these abuses committed against your colleagues certainly fit a larger pattern in Zimbabwe going back yes. many years. You brought up the, yes. the case of Justina Mokoko, who, who yes. many, many people who follow Zimbabwe are familiar with, you know, the, the repeated persecution by prosecution of Beatrice and Tetwa. You know, the yes. list really goes on and on. The beatings often take, you know, carried out in public against women of Zimbabwe arise. Um, Jenny Williams and Magadonga yes. Malengu, and you know, the, the list goes on and on. So I'd like to ask, I mean, given that this is already a pattern and it's, it's well documented, it's well established. However, do you think the current Menangagwa regime feels more emboldened now to commit these heinous acts while the world and regional leaders seem to be distracted by the pandemic? Or again, is this simply par for the course? I think they are extremely emboldened. I think what's regrettable is that um, Mr. Mnangagwa does not have the notoriety that Robert Mugabe did. 
the name recognition. He, is, yeah. he doesn't have the name recognition. He doesn't attract the headlines that Robert Mugabe, Mugabe did. And so, you know, he does things that get swept under the, the carpet. And I think what the world needs to know is that he was Robert Mugabe's chief enforcer. You know, when the genocide happened in 1980, in, the, in 1982, uh, going to 1986, He's the one person who everybody knows was at, at the center of the atrocities. I think we should never run away from that. And now he is at the helm of the state. Yeah. And right. so even when we look at the 2008 violence, the election violence that took place, again, he is fingered in that. So all these human rights violations, he is the person with the commission of inquiry that took place uh, you know, when the, uh, the army was unconstitutionally deployed after the violence that broke out in the 2018 military violence that broke out in Zimbabwe, you'll recall that six people were killed there when the Montlante Commission was then called together. Again, you, people are killed. And then in January, when the fuel protests happened, 17 people killed again. The army is deployed. By who? By the very same Emerson Mnangagwa. These violations continue to take place under the, the rulership of this man. The world needs to start to take notice, like how many Zimbabwean lives need to be lost before the world realizes that we've got a huge problem here, a huge human rights, rights crisis. How many abductions need to take place? Mm. How many? And we all saw what we, we see all the abductions, all the arrests that are taking place. What's sad is, you know, there seems to be a, a normalization of human rights, you know, abuses taking place in Zimbabwe that, look, this is what happens here. But we must call it what it is. The most egregious human rights violations This should not fly anywhere else in the world. It would be completely abnormal. The police are shooting to kill. When someone is need in the United States, it's a huge, huge international issue. And yet in Zimbabwe, we've got the police shooting to kill just randomly. In Wulawayo, it took place, you know? And a young man is just shot and killed and it's business as usual. You've got the police deployed and just randomly restricting movements and it's the most normal thing. We cannot normalize unconstitutional conduct. We cannot normalize breaches of human rights. We cannot allow this country to become a police state under our watch. And yes, Mnangagwa is not called Robert Mugabe, but we've got this continuation and in fact worsening of the, the shrinking of the democratic space and the world has to take notice. Yes, you know, it was announced that there was a new dawn in 2017, but I think the, the mask has fallen and the mask fell very quickly. And I think, you know, we must all see this regime for what it is before it's too late, before we've got a huge massacre on our hands. Not to mention, you know, the humanitarian crises. You know, you've got a public health crisis, you've got a starvation crisis, you've got an education crisis, you've got crisis upon crisis upon crisis, almost every single pillar of this society, of this economy, of the politics, is, everything is falling apart in this country. And, you know, continuously, you know, the democratic space is shrinking and people are calling out and the citizens, free speech is being curtailed, freedom of assembly has been severely restricted. It's now the most normal thing that private property rights are being curtailed. You see soldiers invading private property. You know, that's not normal in any society. And like I said, we should call it for what it is. You see parliament completely being captured by the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've mentioned and, and gone into great detail about these cascading crises, you know, across, across the spectrum in mm. the country. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the recently launched Zano PF must go campaign. I've been seeing a lot of Zimbabweans uh, talking about this, using this hashtag yeah. on social media, on Twitter. Uh, do you think this represents a rising disaffection with the government beyond the confines of social media 
Um, and does this present the prospect uh, for a more consolidated pro-democracy movement moving forward? I would love your thoughts on that. Well, I think after Robert Mnangagwa, uh, Robert, well, <laughs> Robert Mnangagwa, <laughs> <laughs> Good mistake there. Um, after Robert Mugabe um, was gotten rid of in 2017, it became clear that the problems that Zimbabwe faces cannot be attributed to a single personality. So it's never, it's not one single person, but it's an entire system that is responsible for the crises that we face. So it's not a question of removing one person, but it's the entire system that requires to be dismantled. It's an entire institutional framework that is holding the nation at ransom. And that framework is held together by ZANU-PF, which is the political party, the machinery that you know, holds together business, institutions, all the arms of the state. And it's that system that I think the citizens, at least pro democracy, progressive Zimbabweans realize has to go. It's a culture, it's a way of being, it's a mm -hmm. toxic political culture that's holding the country back. That's, you know, stopping people from progressing. And that's what people mean. That's what the citizens mean when they say ZANU-PF must go. That culture, that toxic political culture, it's the corruption it's the, the lack of democracy. It's the inhibition of free speech. It's the prevention of democracy. It's the, the cartels. It's the lack of, inclusive, lack of inclusivity, the tribalism, the, the, all that toxicity, you know, excluding people, you know, doing things on the basis of nepotism, only allowing, you know, the country to benefit uh, the few instead of benefiting many, allowing resources only to be the, the preserve of just a few people who are connected and excluding the masses because Zimbabwe is an extremely wealthy country, the gold, the platinum, the lithium, and yet the masses are starving. So that is what the ZANU-PF must go mantra movement represents. And I think it brings together many Zimbabweans from all walks of life, um, you know, regardless of their strict political persuasions. And I do think that it does have mass support wherever you go, because I think many Zimbabweans are sick and tired of being held back. I mean, you know, you've got a crisis that spans over, you know, decades now. You know, you can't have a crisis that's been slow burning for two, three decades. At some point you say to yourself, we, we, we just need to get out of this logjam. It's exhausting to be in a, a black hole for so many years. And so I do believe that, that although it finds a lot of expression in social media because the, the freedom to protest has been so severely curtailed and people do find a little bit of freedom online because you do get you know, the space to sometimes express yourself a little bit more freely there and sometimes you know, they can't catch you as it were. Although, you know, that, that's increasingly um, becoming threatened. Um, I, I do think that will translate into to something bigger. And let's see what happens with, with that. Right. So we've talked a lot about uh, the ruling party, ZANOPF, and their, their devastation of a once incredibly prosperous um, country that holds so much potential um, from its natural resources to its human capital and its human potential. Um, but I'd like to turn focus really quickly, uh, if we could, to the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, the, the party for which you are a spokeswoman. Yeah. Um, namely, we, we received many questions um, from the audience centering around the topic of survey data that shows African opposition parties typically do quite well in urban areas, the more yes. educated middle class areas, people who have access to social media, for instance, which you were just yes. speaking to, but yes. they don't necessarily always successfully break through in, in rural areas. And I think this has also been the case in Zimbabwe. Um, yes. So in your opinion, what can the MDC Alliance, your party do to, to break through? Do you see that as a problem and, and what is being done to uh, potentially uh, address that uh, as, as the next, as you look forward to the next elections? Thank you. That's a fantastic question, Jeffrey. Um, we have recently set up a, a rural strategy. And this rural strategy is 
of course, the elections are important, but what's more important is to improve people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, just this week, uh, President Nelson Chamisa's mother sadly passed on, and she obviously hails from the rural area of Gutu, uh, which is in, in, in you know, uh, 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 um, the Midlands sort of part of, mm -hmm. of, of Zimbabwe. And, you know, we had the opportunity again to, to get a taste, as it were, of, of the rural areas. And, you know, it must be emphasized that the MDC Alliance has strong support there. It has to be emphasized that people there are suffering. They are not spared from the vagaries of the economic economic destruction caused by Zanu-PF. So the center of our rural strategy is to meet people at their needs, to champion the issues that they face. And um, along with that is to, to mobilize the grassroots, to create cells and structures in the rural areas and to, to create a strong rural base. Now, obviously, ZANU-PF has set itself up in such a way that they weaponize food aid in mm. the rural areas and really try and close up the rural areas and use the chiefs, use the headmen as, you know, their, their stronghold, as it were, use yeah. all that infrastructure to try and close off the opposition. But we, we are not going to use that as an excuse. We're going to use every device available to us to penetrate those rural areas, because at the end of the day, you know, when we are speaking of Zimbabweans, the rural urban divide doesn't change the fact that we're all Zimbabwean at the end of the day. We're all facing a hunger crisis. We're all facing the same governance and political crisis. We all aspire, you know, to, to live in a Zimbabwe where there's freedom, fairness, and opportunity. We all seek upward mobility. We all seek, you know, better opportunities, good education, good public health, a strong economy. You know, even the rural economy has completely fallen apart. And those are the issues. We want progress in the rural areas. We don't just want to win votes and power for power's own sake in the rural areas. Our rural strategy is not just about winning votes. It's about improving the lives of people in the rural areas. So um, I think that's a key difference between the MDC Alliance and ZANU-PF. They just want to use people in the rural areas so that they can win votes and change power. We want to improve the lives of people in the rural areas. And, you know, so our rural strategy really centers around uh, the people, but it's something that's really foremost in our minds and we are going to work on it and we have started working on it already. We've got a secretary for, for rural area, rural strategy, um, Happy Mochi Ziva, who's already, um, you know, set up structures and has started to mobilize already in that area. So thank you so much for raising that and we are completely on it and, and working on developing that currently. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and we're running short on time, but one final question for you, as you know, on the program, we had uh, fellow uh, opposition leaders on the show, Bobby Wine, Tundu oh, Visu. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're, they're like you, they're bravely fighting the good fight against all odds, you know, the, the democratic yes. underdogs of this world. And I would yes. love for you to speak to them uh, and to the audience who is listening. What words of encouragement or lessons learned can you offer for, for the democratic underdogs of the world? You know, what, what sort of good news or inspiration can you point them to, to that, you know, will allow them to keep up the good fight? I think the one thing that I could say, um, especially when I was listening to, to both of them really, um, you know, the story of democracy, especially in Africa, I have to say, whether it's in Tanzania, Uganda, um, you know, or Zimbabwe, it's like you're hearing the same story. I mean, yeah. I hear what's happening in Liberia, I hear what's happening in Sierra Leone, and literally you could just change the names, the characters, the actors, and it's literally the same tale. What I would really like to emphasize um, to all my compatriots, to all my colleagues who are fighting hard to improve the fortunes of Africa, especially on the democratic front, is let's not give up because it does get extremely exhausting and extremely tiring. And sometimes it feels like a fight in vain, but let's not give up, let's not get tired. And most importantly, um, 
we operate in very dangerous environments. It takes courage. Let's remain extremely courageous. Let's remain strong and courageous. Um, fear is not an option. These regimes want us to be fearful, but we need to stare fear in the eye, um, stare tyranny in the eye and say, look, you know, we are not afraid and we're going to continue to fight for freedom. And, you know, what's really fascinating about Africa is that we, we are all countries, we're all nations that were once um, colonized. So we know what it means to not be free. And then we got a facade of freedom, but here we are yet again, fighting for a new freedom. And I think um, it's important for me to say that once we, we gain freedom, that, that day is going to come. Um, let's not be, once we get there, let's not be like these old oppressors. Let's not continue the cycle. Let's ensure that when we finally attain freedom, that we don't repeat the errors of you know, these old oppressors. Let's ensure that we do actually champion a new dawn for the next generation. Let's ensure that their struggles are very different from ours so that Africa is not continuously fighting the same challenges so that the next generation is able to move forward with new struggles and is able to champion Africa and move Africa forward with new challenges and is not continuously fighting for free speech for freedom of movement, for freedom of assembly. Let the next generation be fighting for something else because these basic freedoms have been won. I think those are my words of encouragement to, to the others that are fighting, but please just keep inspiring us. You know, I was listening to Bob Wine, I was listening to, you know, I, I'm just so inspired. Um, keep working hard, we're watching you all the way out in Zimbabwe and we're just so, so, so inspired. So thank you so much for fighting so hard. When you do that, you do it for all of us. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. You are definitely an inspiration to us. Um, we, we admire you and your courage and everything you're trying to accomplish under immensely difficult circumstances. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it so much and we hope to have you on future programs. We'd love to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.